Well, welcome back. We are going to start calculus proper. Last time we did pre-calculus functions and trig functions. Now it's time to see our first real calculus. And we're going to start off with the idea of limits. So in this class today, the next two hours, I'll be covering chapters three and four of the Calculus Lifesaver, um, which involves the theory of limits. So that's about the first half. And then how to solve specific types of limits involving polynomials and similar functions. So in order to begin, I'd like to consider a somewhat bizarre function. I'm going to define this. So we're working in chapter three in section 3.1 of the book, we're going to define a function f of x. I'm going to set it to x minus 1 if x is not equal to 2. But otherwise, I'm just going to say it's not defined. So if x equals 2. In other words, f of x equals x minus 1, and the domain is all numbers except for 2. So the graph of this function looks like this. It's a line, slope 1, with y intercept minus 1. And it would be the complete line, except that there's a hole there, because the point x equals 2 is not in the domain. Now, Later on, I'll come back to why we might even want to look at such a function. But for the moment, let's just play with it and ask, what happens when x is close to 2? We can't have x equals 2. So what happens when x is really near to 2? Well, imagine that this is a mountain with maybe a, a really thin hole there, like a little chasm. And you are walking up the mountain. So you walk up the mountain, and you monitor your height at any time. And you ask yourself, well, what's the height? Well, here, the height is minus 1. This might be relative to sea level or something. It doesn't really matter. You walk up here. Your height is 0. And you never actually get to a height of 1, because there's that little hole there, and you don't want to fall in. But you get very, very close. How close? Well, as close as you like, actually. Arbitrarily close. Doesn't matter how close you want to be to 1. 0.9999999. You choose it. You've got to stop somewhere. Not 0.9 repeater, because that is 1. But however close you want to be, if you walk close enough to that little chasm there, you will get up to that height. So what we'd like to say is, what happens as your x coordinate gets very close to, but not equal to 2, well, then the height gets very close to 1, arbitrarily close. So I'm going to write rim with x goes to 2, x arrow 2 underneath, f of x equals 1. So this is just a compact way or if I, of writing, or if I had to read it out, the limit of f of x as x approaches 2, but is not actually equal to 2, is 1. So as the x coordinate goes to 2, the function value goes to 1. Now, there's actually quite a complicated way of writing down what this means mathematically using so-called epsilons and deltas. I'm not going to talk about that now. Uh, if you look at Appendix A of the book, you will see quite a long discussion about what the epsilons and deltas actually mean. But it is important to have an intuitive idea of what this means. Now, I'd like to look at a very similar function here. g of x is going to be defined in exactly the same way, except that if x equals 2, I'm now going to say g of x is 3. So the graph looks identical. I should have labeled this one y equals f of x. Because now this is going to be y equals g of x.
instead of a hole with nothing above the x coordinate 2, you actually have g of 2 equals 3. So the curve, perhaps you want to think of it instead of a chasm, there's this big spike in front, just a really, really thin spike that goes up as you're walking along. Now, the question is, what is the limit as x goes to 2 of g of x? Surely g of 2 is 3. But this limit is still 1. Because when x is close to 2, the height is still close to 1. It doesn't matter what happens at 2. The fact that g of 2 happens to be 3 is irrelevant. That doesn't make the limit 3. The limit is 1 because when x is near 2, the values of g of x, the heights on this graph, are near 1. Another way of writing either of those limits, for example, this last limit you could say, as x goes to 2, g of x goes to 1. That's an equivalent way of writing it, which is actually quite intuitive. However, it's not as useful for computations as the previous notation, the limit notation. One other little point. The variable x in this limit up here, you might notice that the right-hand side has nothing to do with x. It's just the number 1. x is actually called a dummy variable. It doesn't mean it's stupid. It just means it's a placeholder for a variable that happens to move along the x-axis. Of course, if I change the x-axis and call it a v-axis, the picture still looks the same. So in fact, this limit up here is exactly the same as the limit as v goes to 2 of g of v equals 1. Or change v to any letter. You could even make it a Greek letter like theta. Limit as theta goes to 2 of g of theta is 1. As long as you change in both places in this formula, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a dummy variable. And throughout calculus, we'll be seeing some other applications of dummy variables as well. So that takes care of section 3.1. Now, I'd like to draw another little picture and, again, imagine it as a bit of a mountain that you might be climbing, side view. So let's say that the mountain goes like this. And when x equals 2, there is a jump down like this. And maybe another spike here. So here's a function. I'm not going to say much more about it other than that this is its graph here. So there's clearly something weird going on at 2. So what is the limit as x goes to 2 of whatever this function is? Let's call it h of x. Well, you have to imagine yourself walking along. As you're approaching 2, here your height becomes like 1. Of course, at 2, the height is 2, but that doesn't matter. The problem is, if you start walking from the right, so you're walking this way to the left, the height is close to minus 2. This is a bit of a problem. From the left, you approach height 1. From the right, you approach height minus 2. So let's make up a notation for this. I'll start with the right-hand limit, probably because I'm right-handed. But of course, there's no real preference for one over the other. OK, so here, as you approach from the right to x equals 2, the height goes to minus 2. Now, this I denote 2 plus. The limit as, h, as x goes to 2 plus. And the reason why it's plus is it's when I'm at 2 plus a little bit. Here's a point like 2 plus a little bit. The height's very close to minus 2. Similarly, for the left-hand limit, in this case, it's 1. As you approach 2 minus, if we can just look at this for a second, 2 minus a little bit puts us a little bit to the left of 2. 
then the height goes to 1. Again, there are epsilon delta ways to define this, and they're described in Appendix A. Great. What about this one? We've got the right-hand limit is, two, is minus 2, and the left-hand limit is 1. Because they are not the same, there cannot be an ordinary limit. This is called a two-sided limit, because it's both left and the right. And in this case, it does not exist. D-N-E. That's an abbreviation that I'll use for does not exist. It's not that it's infinity or anything. It just doesn't exist. There is no two-sided limit. In fact, as you might guess from what I've been saying, it is absolutely true that a two-sided limit in general, so this is A is now any number, this is any function, exists if and only if Both the left-hand and right-hand limits exist. That is the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit exist and equal each other. So if you want your two-sided limit to exist, you've got to have a left-hand limit, you've got to have a right-hand limit, and they've got to be the same. But again, the value of the function at that point doesn't matter. All right. So we've seen an example where the limit does not exist. But following section 3.3 .3 of the book, there are other cases where limits cannot exist. Let's take a look at limit as x goes to 0 plus of 1 over x for the moment. OK, the graph of y equals 1 over x looks like this. So what happens as you march up from the right, this is a right-hand limit, as you start walking up? Well, unfortunately, you're going to have quite a climb. In fact, there is no top of that particular mountain. You just keep going up and up and up. And there's no, there's no peak. There's no end in sight. So we're going to say that that limit is infinity. Now, in some sense, it doesn't exist. But actually, I don't want to write DNE here. It's more informative to say infinity, because that tells us that we're going up and up. What about the two-sided limit, though? Well, first of all, what about the left-hand limit? Well, as you walk from the left of 0, you're going to go down and down and down. So you end up to minus infinity. And so because infinity and minus infinity are different, once again, the two-sided limit does not exist. But compare the situation if you look at y equals 1 over x squared instead. That looks almost the same, except that it's now symmetric. It's an even function. And now both the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit are infinity because they both go up. There's no minus infinity. So actually, in this case, the two-sided limit exists but is infinite. So I don't write DNE here. I write infinity, meaning that either, well, both the left-hand and right-hand limits are infinite. So is there anything worse that can happen? Well, unfortunately, yes. Things can get pretty hairy indeed. Let's take a look. Actually, before I, before I do that, I do want to make a comment here. Here's a vertical asymptote. In fact, we now have a better idea of what a vertical asymptote is. We can use limits to say when we have a vertical asymptote. We can be more formal about it. A vertical asymptote, well, let's just say f has a vertical asymptote at x equals a if one of either the left-hand limit or the right-hand limit, or both, maybe I'll 
come back here and say one or both of the left hand limit and the right hand limit is infinity or minus infinity. That's pretty useful. We now have an idea of how to turn the, ID, the, the term vertical asymptote into some sort of limit. So the fact over here, this equation is enough to say that there's a vertical asymptote at least from the right. And then this one says that it's also a vertical asymptote from the left as well. OK, so as I was saying, though, things could get a little hairier than this. Here's a really weird and wacky function. y equals sine 1 over x. For the moment, I'd just like to concentrate on what happens when x is a little bit bigger than 0. So where is this equal to 0 itself? Where, where is y equal 0? What are the x-intercepts? Well, let's suppose that we look at the zeros of sine x itself, but I'll use a capital X. That's 0 amongst other places at pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. That's the graph. It's y equals sine x. Of course, there are other zeros back here, but let's not worry about them for the moment. So if you think of capital X as being equal to little 1 over, 1 over little x, so capital X equals 1 over x, you can see this one has zeros at 1 over pi, 1 over 2 pi, 1 over 3 pi, 1 over 4 pi, and actually not at 0, but 1 over 5 pi, 6 pi, they're getting very bunched up near 0. Let's just do a sanity check on that. If I plug in x equals 1 over pi, I have 1 over 1 over pi, so I just get pi. And yes, sine pi is 0. The same if I put in 1 over 2 pi. I get 1 over 1 over 2 pi, which is just 2 pi. And so sine of that is 0. So we're looking with, for a function with zeros at these bunching up points, 1 over 5 pi, 6 pi, 7 pi, they get really, really close to each other. On the other hand, in between each zero, you've got to visit either minus 1 or 1 and going back and forth. So the graph actually looks something like this. At least, I'm going to start at 1 over pi. 1 over 2 pi is half as much. 1 over 3 pi is a third as much as the original. 1 over 4 pi, and I'm not even going to have room to label it. So it's got to go down to minus 1 here, and then up to 1, and then down to minus 1, up to 1, down to minus 1. And it's got to do this more and more rapidly until you can't even see what on earth is going on, but it never actually gets to 0 because you cannot plug in x equals 0. 1 over 0 is undefined. So somehow, this thing is becoming smudged over. Of course, if you actually zoom in on it, it never touches itself. In my book, I just, I, I just had to put a smudge there because there's no way to have a pen thin enough. Even modern printing cannot make an infinitely thin pen. And even if it could, you probably couldn't see it. But nevertheless, this is such a funky, crazy function that even the right-hand limit does not exist. It's not infinite. It's not minus infinity. It just oscillates between minus 1 and 1 more and more rapidly and cannot make up its mind whether it to be minus 1, 1, or somewhere in between. It certainly doesn't go to somewhere. So unfortunately, if you find yourself walking up and down this, you will just get completely dizzy bobbing up and down like a yo-yo, but really faster and faster. Who knows what happens in the limit? It does not exist. OK, well, we're getting pretty close uh, to finishing off the sort of conceptual theory of limits. There is one more type of limit that is not included in what I've been talking about. 
And that's described in 3.4, limits at infinity or minus infinity. Consider a horizontal asymptote like this. All right. So what happens as you walk along, but instead of getting close to a point, you just keep on going and going and going. What happens to your height? Well, it gets very close to L. It doesn't, doesn't actually get equal to L as you're walking along from here. It's very, very close to L. How close? Once again, as close as you like. If you want to be within, say, 0 0.0001 of L, you'll get there and you'll stay there, that close at least, as long as you go far enough away. And so on. No matter how close you want to be, if you go far enough, you get that close and you stay that close. Again, Appendix A makes that precise, but even if you don't look at that, as long as you have some idea of what's going on, you can still do calculus. So, in this picture, if this is y equals f of x, I would say the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is L. So as x gets very large, f of x goes to L. Another way of writing this is as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to L. Of course, what you can do at infinity, you can also do at minus infinity. So if here is a height m, not necessarily the same as L, function like this, if this is y equals g of x, the limit as x goes to minus infinity of g of x is m. In this graph, by the way, what is the limit as x goes to infinity, plus infinity? Well, the idea is you keep walking, you get higher and higher and higher, so it looks like that limit is infinite. One little comment, a limit at infinity has to be a left-hand limit. Because there's no way to get to infinity from the right. It's already infinite. The same thing with negative infinity. The only way to get down to negative infinity is from the right. So this is automatically a right-hand limit. And of course, the connection with the horizontal asymptotes is now clear, having defined what it means to be a vertical asymptote. Let me say that f or, well, okay, F has a horizontal, and let's be more precise and call it a right-hand horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote at Y equals L. This means the same thing. I'll put it in quotes. That, that sentence means the same thing as limit x goes to infinity of f of x equals capital L, as you can see from the picture above. And of course, there's the same thing. I won't write it out. It is written in the book. But if you replace right hand by left hand, then the limit at minus infinity f of x Actually, let's say this time it's at y equals n. That would mean that the limit as x goes to minus infinity of f of x is equal to capital N. So as you're staring at that, I want to come back to sine of 1 over x. That's that crazy function with the blob near 0. And I want to complete the sketch of it. So let's see. Let's take y equals sine 1 over x. And let's ask ourselves, what happens as x gets very, very large? Not x goes to 0, but 
x goes to infinity. Well, 1 over x gets very, very small. I should say what I mean by large and small. A billion would be a pretty large number. Well, everything is relative, of course. Relative to a trillion, it's, it's not so large. So when I say large, it's a complicated thing. There is actually a description in the book about large and small numbers. But let's just say informally without getting bogged down. When I say large, I mean a huge number, billion, trillion, something like that. What do I mean when I say small? When I say small, I don't mean minus a billion. I actually mean a number close to zero. So 0 0.0001 minus 0 0.0008. So what is minus a trillion? Well, that's a negatively large number. It's still large in absolute value. That's a very, very imprecise ad hoc definition, but it will be nice to have some common ground here. So I just want you to understand that small means near zero. That's very important. So in any case, suppose x is large. Think of it as a trillion. What's 1 over x? Well, that is a trillionth. It's a number very, very close to zero. It's a small number, tiny number. Now, if you think about it, sine of zero equals zero. Here's a graph of y equals sine x. Sure, it keeps going in waves, but near zero, sine of x is also close to zero. So if x is here, sine is not very big. And when x is even closer to 0, sine of x is also closer to 0. I'm actually flirting with the idea of continuity right now. But I'm not going to talk about that until next time. But suffice it to say that as x goes to infinity, we can see 1 over x goes to 0. 1 over x goes to 0. If x is a trillion, 1 over x is a trillionth. The larger x is, the closer 1 over x is to 0. And because sine of a very small number is close to 0, sine 1 over x goes to sine of 0, which, as I've said, is 0. Again, the proof is in Appendix A. But the intuition, hopefully, is clear. So what this means is, we can take our graph, which I drew up on the previous board, but I'll just quickly sketch it again so that we don't have to run back and forth. It had this crazy behavior where it oscillates between minus 1 and 1. Well, it didn't quite make it up there, I'm afraid. So I'll just move 1. A smudge of silliness. What happens? Well, it goes up to 1, but as we've said, as x goes to infinity, sine 1 of x goes to 0. This means that y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. So it actually comes down and looks like this. So that gives us the graph of y equals sine 1 over x at least to the right of the x-axis. Now, what happens to the left of the x-axis? Well, rather than reinvent the wheel, let f of x be equal to sine 1 over x. What is f of minus x? Well, it's sine 1 over minus x. And because, as I said last time, Sine is an odd function. This means you can pull the minus out. And of course, this is just the negative of the original function. In other words, this function is odd. This is an odd function. And that means that the graph has a symmetry. We can pretend that the whole thing is a wire and just sort of turn it around. So we'll have zeros at minus 1 over pi, minus 1 over 2 pi, and so on, with this, again, crazy behavior here. Uh, the, there will still be an asymptote, but it's going to come down on the negative side. And we're just going to use the symmetry here 
And again, it's not actually supposed to cross itself. But it's sort of like a mirror image, but flipped. And there is no value at 0. It's almost impossible to draw that. But I'll try to put an empty circle there, because sine of 1 over 0 doesn't make any sense. So there's the complete graph of y equals sine 1 over x with its glorious uh, smudge in the middle. All right. Now, while we're talking about horizontal asymptotes, I want to just mention a couple of misconceptions. This is in section 3.5. Really briefly, there are some misconceptions that people have about asymptotes. Uh, the first is that a function cannot cross its asymptote. And that is just not true. For example, here's a horizontal. These are really misconceptions about horizontal asymptotes. Look, here's a function that crosses its asymptote. It doesn't matter. It's only the behavior as you get large. This point here has nothing to do with the asymptote. Might as well just cover it up and say, that's really what's going on. It's getting close. But it can actually be more interesting. Very shortly, we'll look at this function, y equals sine x over x. Well, since we're going to be spending a little time looking at this function, let's see what it's like when x is large. Let's see what happens as x goes to infinity. Well, sine x sort of oscillates like this between 1 and minus 1. The problem is, though, that you really have to multiply this by 1 over x. Think of it as 1 over x times sine x. So whenever sine x wanders up to 1, you get exactly 1 over x. Whereas if it goes down to minus 1, you get minus 1 over x. So the graph of this thing must look like the oscillating thing, but modulated, as it's called. That's a technical term. Again, by these envelope functions. That's another technical term. If I draw y equals 1 over x, and y equals negative 1 over x, then at least from pi onwards, it's going to be like sine x, but being dampened and dampened. Now, in a few minutes, we will see that that limit is, in fact, 0. So this is a horizontal asymptote. But the function not only crosses it once, it keeps on crossing over and over and over and over. So as a matter of fact, that is a horizontal asymptote, and the function crosses it infinitely often. So don't think that a horizontal asymptote means that the function never crosses it. All right, I said there were two misconceptions. Here's another one. The left hand and right hand horizontal asymptotes have to be the same. Not true. Consider y equals inverse tan x. We'll be looking at it more closely in due course. But you probably have seen the graph of this at some point. It looks something like this. So it has a right-hand limit of pi over 2. Right-hand limit in the sense as x goes to infinity. Right-hand horizontal asymptote and a left-hand one asymptote at negative pi over 2, not the same thing. And these limits you should learn, because they do come up from time to time. So as you can see from the graph, no, you do not have to have the same left-hand and right-hand horizontal asymptotes. Excellent. So what's next? Well, we just have really one more bit of theory that we have to look at. And that is the sandwich principle. Another name for this is the squeeze principle. So as soon as I get some blackboard space, I'll tell you what it is. Any questions? Well, in that case, let me tell you about the sandwich principle. 
So inspired by this last example of the envelope functions, I like to sort of suppose that we have some pretty wobbly function that seems like it's hard to deal with. And we want to know what happens to it. Now, so let's, let's call this f of x. So suppose we have another function. I'm going to make use of some colored chalk that I have here. Suppose I have another function that's always bigger than it, which I'll call g of x. And another function that's always smaller. When I say always, actually, I don't really care what's going on over here. I really only care what's going on in this picture when I'm getting larger and larger. So it doesn't technically matter if they eventually end up crossing. As long as after a certain point, g is always on top of f, and all f is always on top of h. So if h of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to g of x for x large enough. So suppose this is true. And you also have that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, uh, I'm sorry, of g of x is some height l. And the same thing is true for h of x. If all three of these things are true, then the conclusion is that f has the same limit as well. Let's see what's going on. g is bearing down, pressing down the function. It's going to L. H, on the other hand, is coming up underneath the function. So the function is really the filling in a sandwich. Or if you prefer, it's getting squeezed. And so these two things, if they have the same limit, are pinching the middle thing, which is squirming around inside, down to L. And so it has the same limit as well. So this, for example, gives us an immediate way of proving the limit that I was trying to say before, at least I drew a graph of it, but I never really justified it. That as x gets very large, sine x over x goes to 0. The limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x is 0. So how do you prove this? Well, the best way to start is you remember sine of anything is between minus 1 and 1. Not just sine x, sine of any number at all is between minus 1 and 1. Now let's divide this quantity by x. And provided that x is positive, which it certainly is as it goes to infinity, then I get this. And minus 1 over x is less than or equal to sine x over x is less than or equal to 1 over x. And you can see why I did this. That's what we want the limit of. Now let's take a look at this function h of x and this function g of x, say. I'm going to call them that. What is the limit of the top function as x goes to infinity? Well, as x gets very large, 1 over x gets very small. It goes to 0. How about the limit as x goes to minus infinity? Well. Again, if x is a huge negative number, like minus a trillion, 1 over x is minus a trillionth, a tiny negative number. And so that's going to go to 0 as well. So the conclusion is, from this, we're going to say, by the sandwich principle, and instead of sandwich, you can write squeeze if you want. It's the same thing. The limit we want is also 0. So what's important is this inequality here, where the thing we want is sandwiched in between two other things. And then both of their limits are equal to 0. Now, I have written something wrong here. I've been careless. 
I want you to erase this in your notes if you're taking any. I meant to put the minus here. Let's just look at that for a second as I clean up after my little mess. This is g of x, 1 over x. h of x over here is negative 1 over x. That's what I meant to write here. And both limits are as x goes to infinity. I apologize for that. So please correct that. They're both limits as x goes to infinity. 1 over x is coming from above. Negative 1 over x is coming from below and they trap sandwich sine x over x in between. Good. Well, it doesn't just work at infinity. It works at any point A, or at minus infinity, if you prefer. Here's what it looks like near A. Our function is sort of moving around. We don't really know what happens at A, but we'd like the limit to be L. Again, we find a function above that has the same limit at A, and we find a function below that has the same limit. So the statement is identical to what I had written above, except that instead of the limit being as x goes to infinity, it's all the limits are as x goes to A. So for example, what is the limit as x goes to 0? of x sine 1 over x. Well, we already looked at this without the x there. We decided that limit doesn't exist. That was that crazy function that went up and down. But with the x, things change a little bit. Let's look at the right-hand limit to save some time here. If you consider that sine of 1 over x is between minus 1 and 1. Again, as I've said, sine of anything is between minus 1 and 1. And this time, we're going to multiply this equation by x, which is greater than 0 because we're taking the right-hand limit. And so this becomes negative x is less than or equal to x sine 1 over x is less than or equal to x. And the reason I did this is because I want to understand what happens to x sine 1 over x. Now, we'll replay this thing. Let's take the bigger one. The limit of x as x goes to 0 from above is surely 0. And the limit of negative x as x goes to 0 is also 0. I mean, as x goes to 0, x goes to 0. It's not really even saying much there. So does negative x. Negative x goes to negative 0, but negative 0 is just 0. So again, the conclusion is, by the sandwich principle, I'll call it the squeeze principle this time, just to be fair, this limit is 0. What about the left-hand limit? Well, it turns out that this function is even. Since sine 1 over x is odd and x is odd, the product is even. But even not worrying about that, why can't you just repeat the same argument? Well, you almost can. The difficulty is if you multiply by x when x is negative, as it is for the left-hand limit, then you have to reverse the inequalities. So if x is negative, you really need to turn that into a greater than or equal and this into a greater than or equal. But it doesn't make a difference. All you've done is just switch g and h, whichever one's bigger, whichever one's smaller. The rest of it is still the same argument. Both functions go to 0. And so the left-hand limit is also 0. So in fact, the two-sided limit, we can even scrap this plus and the two-sided limit is 0. Great. Well, section 3.7 of the book has a summary of these different types of limits in little diagrams. And it's just good to refresh your memory of, about all these different types because there's so many variations. However, the real meat comes when you try to solve problems. And so for the rest of the time, I am going to be dealing with chapter 4, which is 
the beginning of a bit of a long road involving different types of limit problems. We're not really going to look much at trig functions or exponentials or logarithms right now. Let's just concentrate on polynomials and similar functions and how to compute limits involving them. Any questions? Everyone's very quiet today. All right, so moving on to chapter four. I'd like you to consider this limit here. So let's get serious about actually computing some limits. OK, x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x minus 2. Well, let's try plugging in x equals minus 1. Let's just put x equals minus 1. What do you get? Well, you get minus 1 all squared minus 3 times minus 1 plus 2 over minus 1 minus 2. So I've just replaced x by negative 1. I get 1 plus 3 plus 2 is 6 divided by minus 3, so this works out to be negative 2. Wait a second. I thought that I said, in fact, I know that I said, that the value of this object here at x equals minus 1 doesn't matter. So how can I, I plug in minus 1? Well, that's actually continuity. And so I'm going to say a little bit more about that next time. But Let's just take it as given that if you can plug in a value and get a nice finite number, then that is the value of the limit in most cases. Certainly whenever it's a poly over a poly, polynomial over a polynomial like this. But what about this limit? Take the same function, but now ask what happens as x goes to 2, not negative 1. Well, you'll get 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2 over 2 minus 2. And if you compute the top, it's 4 minus 6 plus 2 is 0, and 2 minus 2 is 0. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That's a very dubious equality, as is this. What does 0 over 0 mean? In fact, it doesn't really mean anything. It's an indeterminate form. That's a technical term for an expression like 0 over 0. So we have to be a little clever. Let's watch how you actually do this limit. The trick is factor the top. It's a quadratic. And if we factor it, it works out to be x minus 2 outside of x minus 1. You should just be able to see that. But you can use the quadratic formula if you want to help you factor it. The denominator is x minus 2. So the next thing we do is simply cancel out the x minus 2. And so you get the limit as x goes to 2 of just x minus 1. And now I can plug in x equals 2 and get 2 minus 1, which is 1. So what have I actually done here? Let's just take a look. I've canceled out x minus 2. That's OK, provided that x minus 2 is not 0. You're not allowed to cancel out 0 over 0. But actually, x is not equal to 2. x is close to 2, not equal to 2. So the quantity x minus 2 is very, very tiny. It's like 0, but not actually 0. And this is the same quantity on the bottom. So since neither of them are 0, but they're equal, we can cancel it out. And so this limit is justified. In fact, you can see that the graph of this function, y equals, oh, let's call it f of x, is equal to x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x minus 2. This is just x minus 1 which we already graphed right at the beginning of this class. 
It's just the line. Except that, again, x cannot be equal to 2. And we arrive then at the very first limit that I talked about at the very, you know, at the beginning of this class. There is this function. It's just y equals x minus 1. There it is. Except when x equals 2. When x equals 2, it's not defined. And so you end up with this function here. So isn't this equal to x minus 1? Only when x is not equal to 2. Otherwise, it's undefined. If x equals 2, it's undefined, because you cannot divide by 0. So the beauty is that the limit actually strips away x equals 2. It doesn't really care what happens, and so the algebra is correct. OK, well, now that we've sort of looked at some theory here, let's take a look at another example. So I want the limit as x goes to 3 of x cubed minus 27 over x to the fourth uh, minus 5x cubed plus 6x squared. OK, this is a little bit more complicated, but it's the same principle. If you plug in 3, you will find the top is 0. And I'm not going to do it. I'll leave it to you to plug in 3 to the fourth is 81. If you actually plug in these things, you do get 0 over 0. So you're sort of screwed unless you factor the quadratics. Well, what quadratics? Actually, you've got a cubic here and a fourth degree there. So things are a little bit nastier. Well, the bottom is nothing to panic about. Let's just take out a factor of x squared. We'll set up a little working column here. So the bottom looks like x squared outside of x squared minus 5x plus 6. This is a quadratic, so we can write this as x minus 6, x minus, x minus 1. No, that's not right. x minus 3, x minus 2. That is right. Minus 3 times minus 2 is 6. Minus 3 plus minus 2 is minus 5. But how about the x cubed minus 27? Well, there is an identity that you may know. If you don't, I suggest that you learn it. Here it is called the difference of cubes. x cubed minus a cubed is equal to x minus a outside of x squared plus ax plus a squared. That's very useful. In fact, I'll put a box around it. I don't need it for this question, but there is actually a sum of cubes identity, which is very similar, that also is worth learning, even though you can get it very easily from the other one. Not bad to learn it separately. It looks the same, except that you change that minus into a plus, and to compensate that plus into a minus. That's how it works out. So that's the sum of cubes identity. We're going to use the difference of cubes identity over here, but with a equals 3. And so the top is x minus 3, x squared, plus 3x, plus 3 squared, which is 9. And on the bottom, I'm just going to repeat the factoring. We wrote x squared, x minus 3, x minus 2. Now you can clearly see that if you plug in 3, this factor will give you 0, and this factor will give you 0. So it's 0 over 0. The beauty is that x is not actually equal to 3. It's very close to 3, which allows us to mix these two factors here. And now all we have to do is substitute. So we get 3 squared plus 3 times 3 plus 9 over 3 squared times 3 minus 2. So this is 9 plus 9 plus 9 is 27 divided by 9. And that's 1. So it works out to be 3. That's the limit. All right. See how this blue and pink chalk erases. Not so bad. Any questions? If you have one, you just have to shout it out. I'm listening.
All right. I want to show you another polynomial. Let's consider this limit here. It's a poly over poly. So it's 2x squared minus x over 6. And I'll factor the bottom. I'll leave it in factored form already as x, x minus 1, or cubed. So what happens if you plug in x equals 1 into this? Well, you get 2 times 1 minus 1 minus 6. So you'll actually get negative 5. At the bottom, you'll get 0 because of that. So this is actually not an indeterminate form. It still doesn't really make sense because it's minus 5 over 0. But at least it's not 0 over 0. The bottom is going to be 0 in the limit. The top is not. This is going to create a vertical asymptote. So a good rule of thumb is that if when you plug in, you get 0 on the bottom but not on the top, you have a vertical asymptote. The problem is there are four types of behaviors that can arise when you have a vertical asymptote. Here they are. Suppose the action is at some point A. You might have this. You might have this. Of course, it's possible to look like this, or like this. So I've been saying this. What happens here is that the two-sided limit is infinity. So both the left-hand and the right-hand limits are infinity. Here, the two-sided limit is minus infinity. Here, there's no two-sided limit. The right-hand limit is infinite. The left-hand limit is negative infinity. And here, the right-hand limit is negative infinity, and the left-hand limit is positive infinity. So if you look at something like this, I tell you, the 0 on the bottom means that you are going to be in one of those cases. The question is, which one? And the best way to analyze this is to ask yourself what happens as you put a number very close to, but not equal to, 1. Well, I want you to consider both the left-hand and the right-hand limits separately. So let's look at the limit as x goes to 1 plus of the same quantity. What happens if you put a number a little bigger than 1 here? Well, the top is still going to be very close to negative 5. So the top is a number about minus 5. So it's about minus 5. The first factor, x, here is a number that's very close to 1. And the interesting thing is this factor here. When x is a little bit bigger than 1, like 1.001, you get the cube of a positive number. So I'll just put tiny positive number. So when x is just a little bit bigger than 1, the top is very close to minus 5. The bottom is very close to 1 times a tiny positive number. And of course, if you take minus 5 over a tiny positive number, you're going to get a huge negative number. If you don't believe me, try 1 trillionth in there. You'll get negative 5 over 1 trillionth, which is negative 5 trillion. So this is a huge negative number. So actually, the left hand, the right hand limit is negative infinity. And if you repeat it, though, from the left hand side, I'll rewrite the function again. Well, if you put in a number a little bit less than 1, the top is still very close to negative 5. So this is, uh, I should write 2x squared minus x minus 6 over x, x minus 1 all cubed is very close to minus 5. Again, x is very close to 1. But now you get the cube of a tiny negative number. After all, if x is less than 1, then x minus 1 is negative. Right? If x is 0.99, then 0.99 minus 1 is negative 0.01. 
So because you cube a, a negative number, you still get a negative number. This is now negative 5 over negative, and you get a huge positive number. The minuses cancel out. So actually, this original limit up here does not exist. The right-hand limit is negative infinity, and the left-hand limit is positive infinity. So we're actually in this case here. We're in this case, as we go from the right, we go down to negative infinity. From the left, positive infinity. What would happen if you change this 2 here? I'm sorry, I don't know how this became a 2. This should have been a 3, as it was in the original question. I'm just getting ahead of myself here. What if you change it to a 2? If you change it to a 2, so let's just look at the original problem. Let's look back up here, since I got my 3s and 2s confused. In fact, let's change it to a 4. Let's change this 3 to a 4. How does everything change? Well, now the top is still close to minus 5 whenever x is near 1, and the x is still close to 1. But this is now a tiny positive quantity, no matter whether you're on the left or right, because fourth powers are always positive. So actually, if you work through it, you'll find that you get minus something, minus 5 over a tiny positive number, no matter whether you're at the left or the right, which is going to give you a huge negative number, minus a trillion, minus 10, going down to minus infinity. So actually, with the 4 here, you will be, in this case, both the left-hand and the right-hand limits are negative infinity. So I'd like it if you would take a few minutes and convince yourselves of these facts. I'm not really proving it formally. You kind of need the epsilons and deltas to really, really nail that. Um, but nevertheless, the intuition is clear. When you divide something non-zero by a really, really tiny number, you either get a really huge number or a really huge negative number. OK. Well, that sort of wraps up section 4.1. So let's move on to 4.2. There's a little section about how to deal with square roots. So sometimes you don't actually have a poly over a poly you might have a square root. Consider this example. Limit as x goes to 5 over the square root x squared minus 9 minus 4 over quantity x minus 5. OK, I try plugging in x equals 5. In here, I'm going to get x squared is 25. 25 minus 9 is 16. And the square root of 16 is 4. So the top will be 4 minus 4, it's 0. The bottom, also 0. So if you actually plug in x equals 5, you get 0 over 0. That's back to our indeterminate form. There's no, it's not obviously a vertical asymptote, and we can't write down the answer obviously. So what do we do? This is not so easy to factor. Instead, we're going to multiply by what's called the conjugate expression, and then Divide by it. So whenever you have a square root minus something, or something minus a square root, or even plus a square root, the best thing to do is to take the expression square root minus something and change the minus to a plus. Not this minus here, because that's trapped in the square root. It's the square root minus something. Change the minus to a plus. Or if this was a plus, you would change it to a minus. And what do you do? Well, you multiply and divide by that quantity. I'm not going to take the limit yet, so I'm just going to rewrite it. I'm going to take my original limit and just rewrite it out again. But I'm going to multiply by the conjugate root x squared minus 9 plus 4 over root x squared minus 9 plus 4. And the beauty of it is that a minus b times a plus b 
is a squared minus b squared. That's the difference of squares. So the numerator of this kills the square root. You just get this squared minus this squared. And you can write it straight down. x squared minus 9, that's no square root, minus 16. On the bottom, you have the original x minus 5. And then you have this other factor. You can't, can't forget to put that in. It's still got to be there. Now, we haven't actually taken any limits yet. We've just done algebra. We've taken our original expression over here. And we've written it algebraically in a different expression. In fact, we can even do more. The top is x squared minus 25. And we can factor that into x minus 5, x plus 5. And that's very handy, because now we can clearly cancel out the first factor on the top and the bottom. Remember, x is not equal to 5. It's only very close to it. And now we can just substitute. And if we do, we get on the top 10, which is 5 plus 5. On the bottom, we already decided 25 minus 9 is 16. The square root is 4, so you get 4 plus 4, which is 8. And 10 eighths is the same as 5 fourths. So as a general sort of rule, if you're stuck with a square root minus something, or plus something, actually, this could even be another square root type expression. Try multiplying and dividing by the conjugate. Of course, you need to divide. You can't just multiply. You're only allowed to multiply something by 1 without changing it. Any questions? OK, well, sort of what I wanted to say about square roots for the time being. We'll see some more examples as we go on through the course. It's the same trick. But I would now like to turn to a very important type of problem. So this is in section 4.3. We've looked at what's called rational functions. That's poly over poly. I'd like to consider something like this. Seven x to the fourth plus five x cubed plus two thousand x squared minus six. That's a polynomial. What happens to it when x is really, really huge? Say a billion. Well, you'll get 7 times a billion to the fourth, plus 5 times a billion cubed. And there are other terms as well. Let's just think about this. A billion to the fourth, that's one with a lot of zeros. A billion already has nine zeros. The fourth power actually will have 36 zeros, whereas the cube only has 27 zeros. So when you add this, it doesn't make much of a dent compared to the one with 36 zeros. The x squared only has 18 zeros. Still a huge, huge number. Anyone would be happy to have that much money. Well, that's debatable. It would be more than the amount of money in the world, so it could get a little bit weird. But nevertheless, the point is, it doesn't even make a dent. Even with the 2,000 in the front, that still only gives you three more zeros. This thing is supreme. And as for the minus 6, well, that's just pff, laughable. Doesn't even, doesn't, it's not even noticeable. So I'd like you to look at this and say that when x is a large number, this is the dominant term. This is the dominant term. That's the important thing. The rest of it is just wrinkles. So in order to express this, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you that this thing is very close to just 7x to the fourth. Now, if this actually equals 7x to the fourth, suppose that equation was true. 
That's sort of what I'm saying, that this is basically like 7x to the fourth. So if that ratio were true, then this top would actually equal the bottom. But that's not true. On the other hand, it is true as x goes to infinity. So if I take any polynomial and I divide it by its leading term, its highest degree term, that limit is 1. Why? Well, it's not so hard to prove it in general. If you just look at this example, let's not assume that it's 1. Let's just say equals. Suppose you just bust up the fraction into four pieces. The first one will be 7x to the fourth over 7x to the fourth, which is actually 1. What about this over this? Well, you've got these numbers 5 and 7, but the important thing is the 3 cancels out with the 4 to leave you 1 power of x on the bottom. Here we have 2,000, and this time we have a x squared on the bottom. And here we have x to the fourth. Now, what happens as x goes to infinity? Well, because x is on the bottom, you're dividing by a huge number, you get a tiny number. Same with the square, same with the fourth. Doesn't matter. The power doesn't matter. This goes to 0, 0, 0. The whole thing then is 1 plus 0 plus 0 minus 0. It is 1. The same trick also works as x goes to negative infinity. The argument is exactly the same, except now this is a huge negative number. doesn't matter. When you divide by 5 over minus 7 trillion, it's still very close to 0. So again, the limit is 1. Now we're going to utilize this in some nice ways. Let's consider this example. Limit as x goes to infinity, x minus 8x to the fourth over 7x to the fourth, same as the one I wrote above. OK, so consider this limit here. Now, this is a poly over a poly. There are different ways of doing this, but I kind of like this method because it encapsulates what I've been talking about. The top, it's a bit of a trick. I wrote it out of order. Negative 8x to the fourth is the highest degree term. So the top should behave just like this. And the bottom should behave just like this with nothing else. So it should just be minus 8 sevenths. You can almost see the answer. How do we make it fall? Well, here's what I recommend. Treat the top and the bottom separately. What you want to do is, on the top, divide by the leading term, negative 8x to the fourth. And to compensate, multiply by it again. And we'll do the same on the bottom. The leading term is 7x to the fourth. So I divide by 7x to the fourth, and I multiply again by 7x to the fourth. Now, what's the point of these manipulations? Well, the point is that if I've done it correctly, that will just become 1, and that will just become 1 when I take the limit. And all the action is going on in these leading terms. And in fact, I can cancel out the x to the fourth. So let's actually just finish it off formally. On the top, in addition to this minus 8, which I'll collect at the end, I have x over negative 8x to the fourth. So this is negative 1 over 8x cubed. But then I'll have a plus 1. On the bottom, I have exactly what I had before, 1 plus 5 over 7x squared, 7x cubed, actually. No, just 7x. I'm sorry. Getting tied up in knots. 2,000 over 7x squared minus 6 over 7x to the fourth. And then I have the minus 8 sevenths that was left over. 
Again, as x goes to infinity, that term goes to zero. Anything with just the x on the bottom by itself, or a power of x, goes to zero. And so I just get 1. Or more formally, I can write minus 0 plus 1. 1 plus 0 plus 0 minus 0. And that goes to 1 over 1. And so the answer is indeed negative 8 seconds. All right. Let's see what happens in a slightly different case. Let's take the limit as x goes to infinity. And I'm going to give it to you in factors. x to the fourth plus 3x minus 99 outside of 2 minus x to the fifth over 18x to the seventh plus 9x to the sixth minus 3x squared minus 1 and another factor of x plus 1. Okay, well this is a poly over a poly. This time, I'm not going to expand. I'm going to treat every term, every product term or quotient term separately. So let's tackle them one at a time. I hope I have enough room. For the first factor, I'll take x to the fourth plus 3x minus 99. The highest degree term is x to the fourth. So I simply multiply and divide at the same time by x to the fourth. How about 2 minus x to the fifth? Well, the leading term is negative x to the fifth. So I multiply and divide by that. And the same thing on the bottom. I'll take this nasty expression. 18x to the 7th plus 9x to the 6th minus 3x squared minus 1. And I'll divide by 18x to the 7th. But then, of course, I have to multiply by 18x to the 7th. And finally, I have x plus 1. The highest degree term is just x. So I multiply and divide by x. OK, I didn't have to work out what the degree of the top was. I didn't have to work out anything. I just treated each factor separately. Well, I've got to take a little bit of a break in the middle of the problem because I don't have any room. So bear with me. All right, let's keep going. So picking up where we left off, Actually, let's just look at this for a second. Let's come back over here. We've got x to the fourth, x to the fifth, with a minus. So that's negative x to the ninth. On the bottom, we've got 18x to the seventh and x. So that's 18x to the eighth. So x to the ninth, x to the eighth, we're just going to have an x. So all the terms with parentheses around them this works out to 18x to the ninth. No, that's not right. Where's the eraser? Negative x to the ninth over 18x to the eight. So I've just consolidated that. What about the rest of the junk? Well, the first term is going to be 1 plus 3 over x cubed minus 99 over x to the fourth. That's just algebra. As for the other term, I get minus 2 over x to the fifth plus 1. On the denominator, if you look at it, you have 1 plus 9 
of 18x. Now, I agree I could cancel out the 9 and 18, but it's actually a waste of time since it's going to go to 0 anyway. Similarly, the next term works out to minus 3 over 18x to the fifth. Don't bother canceling. There's no point. Unfortunately, I have not left myself enough room, so I'm going to just pull a little switcheroo here and shove this over. And the last term left me with a 1 plus 1 over x. So now the idea here is you cancel the x to the 9 and the 18x to the 8 and just replace this by minus x over 18 as a factor. Now what happens to all this garbage? It looks really horrible, but this is 1, 0, 0 times 1, 0. 1, 0, 0, 0. 1, 0. It's just 1 when you take the limit. So in the limit, this is 1 times 1 over 1 times 1. The problem is x is going to infinity. So negative x is going to negative infinity. And unfortunately, the 18 doesn't really help because it's just a finite number. The answer is minus infinity. This step is sort of a little bit feeble from a mathematical point of view. The idea is that you can actually split up the limit into two limits. This limit is 1, but that limit is negative infinity. And some care is required here to do it absolutely formally. But nevertheless, that is the solution. Now, this is actually a special case of a general result. If you look back over here at the original, the degree of the top is actually 9 because it's 4 plus 5. And we saw this when we got an x to the ninth on the top. The degree of the bottom is 7 plus 1, which is 8. So the degree of the top is more than the degree of the bottom. If that happens, your limit is going to be infinity or minus infinity. When the degrees are equal, then you get the ratio of the coefficients of the top to the bottom, like in this example here. Both degree 4. So I get minus 8 over 7. What if the degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom? Well, I'm not going to do an example of it, but there is one in section 4.3. And if you look at it, you will see that actually the limit has to be 0. Now, these are very useful rules of thumb to be aware of. But I don't want to even write them down on the board right now, because everything can be solved directly by these methods. And the solution is better, because you can really see what's going on. And also, when square roots and other sort of crazy stuff is around, that actually works even if there isn't a degree. Square roots kind of screw up the whole notion of degree. So in fact, let's look at such an object and see why I don't want to sort of even talk much about degrees. This is moving on to section 4.4. Consider the limit as x goes to infinity of square root 16x to the fourth plus 8 plus 3x all over 2x squared plus 6x plus 1. What's the degree of the top? Well, it's not even a polynomial. It's not 4 because of the square root. On the other hand, if you look at 16x to the fourth, that doesn't really do much. The 8 doesn't do much, rather. So maybe this behaves like the square root of 16x to the fourth, which is 4x squared. And 4x squared beats 3x. So Let's handle this like as follows. So first of all, we'll take care of the bottom very quickly because it is a polynomial. Here, the highest degree term is 2x squared. So we multiply and divide by it, no problem. But on the top, our intuition is that the square root behaves like 4x squared. I'm thinking of this as behaving 
like 16x to the fourth, which is 4x squared, and that's going to beat up on the 3x. So let's just divide the top and bottom. by 4x squared. Well, we have a little bit of work we need to do here. I'm a bit of a wimp, so I'll, I'll deal with the bottom first. That's just 1 plus 6 over x, 6 over 2x, plus 1 over 2x squared. Actually, if you look back up here, I'm going to cancel out the x squareds, and I'm going to cancel the 4 with the 2, just to leave a factor of 2. But I still have to deal with this. So how do I deal with the square root over the 4x? I simply inhale the 4x squared into the square root and make it root 16x to the 4th plus 8 over the square of 4x squared, which is in fact 16x to the 4. And then I do have to worry about the other term, but that's just going to be 3 plus 4x. And finally, I have that 2 floating around. And now I can finish it off. One more little step. Inside the square root, I'm just going to write 1 plus 8 over 16x to the 4th. I'm just going to write it like this. copy the denominator. Now what happens? Well, this goes to 0, 0, 0, 0. And so I get the square root 1 plus 0 plus 0, 1 plus 0 plus 0. Of course, the square root of 1 is 1. Everything works out 1. And we just get 2. I'm going to leave this down the bottom. In fact, I might not even use the top for the moment. I want to look at two more problems. And to save time, I'm just going to ask, what if I change this to x goes to negative infinity. How's the blue look in the video? Can you read that? Good. What happens as x goes to negative infinity? Does anything change? Well, we can still move along to the second step. Of course, we better put a minus infinity here, but no big deal. In fact, everything is the same, except I'm going to put a minus infinity. Again, at this step, all we've done is algebra. It doesn't matter what x is, as long as it's not 0. But as x goes to negative infinity, all the same things with the powers of x on the bottom also go to 0. Very nice. So the end result is that the limit is still negative 8 sevenths. How about this problem, the second one we looked at? Let's change that to negative infinity. Well, again. Maybe we can gradually pan over here. We'll see negative infinity there, but there's no difference. Then we have to come to the top of the board here. And we'll have x goes to negative infinity instead. And now there's a slight change. You see, I had to plug in x equals infinity before. Now I have to plug in x equals negative infinity, and so this will change to infinity. And so the answer will be plus infinity for this one. So it's not always the same. It's not always the same at negative infinity. In fact, I'd like to show you one example where things can be even worse. Consider the limit as x goes to negative infinity. 
of 4x to the 6th plus 8 square root over 2x cubed plus 6x plus 1. Okay, it's a lovely example. Nothing wrong with it. Check this out. Bottom highest degree is x cubed. The highest term is 2x cubed. So I simply multiply and divide by 2x cubed. Well, on the top, rather than even think about it, since it is just the square root of something, I'm just going to work within the square root. Divide by 4x to the 6th within the square root. And then, to compensate, I'll multiply by the square root of 4x to the 6th. I didn't actually do that in the previous example, just recently involving the square root, because there was also something added on here. I had to be a little cleverer. But in this particular case, yes, there's a polynomial within the square root, so I'll just operate within the square root and multiply by the square root to compensate. OK, well, let's keep going with our normal prescription. This is the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the square root. We'll get 8 over 4x to the 6. No need to cancel that down to 2. On the bottom, I'll have 1 plus 6 over 2x squared plus 1 over 2x cubed. No problem. Well, 2x cubed is 2x cubed. The question is, what is the square root of 4x to the 6th? Perhaps you are tempted immediately to write 2x cubed. But that is not true. The truth is that you need to write a minus. Now, let's spend just a few seconds before coming back to wrapping up the solution there. Let's just look at what I'm saying here. I take the square root of 4x to the 6th, and I am telling you, you cannot just automatically write down 2x cubed. If x is positive, then sure, to take the square root of this, you get a positive number, because every square root is a positive number. This symbol, radical sign, means the positive square root. So if x is positive, then this is true. This is true if x is positive, or 0. But if x is negative, it cannot be true. Let's just see why. If x is negative, this is a positive number. But the problem is x cubed is negative. x is negative, so x cubed is negative. So you cannot have a positive number equals a negative number. It must be minus 2x cubed, because negative of the negative number is a positive number. Now both sides are positive. Plus VE is positive. Both sides are positive. And of course, if you square it, you do get 4x to the sixth on both sides. So this, is, this makes sense. So the point is, in this limit, x is going to negative infinity. That means x is a negative number, a big negative number, but a negative number nevertheless. And so to go from up here, root 4x to the sixth, down to 2x cubed would be a mistake without the minus. So you need the minus. So what does that leave us with? Well, x cubed, x cubed, minus 2 over 2. When I finish the limit, I do get root 1 and plus 0 over 1 plus 0 plus 0. Minus 2 over 2 is negative 1. So you get the answer negative 1. Not plus 1. It's a trap. It's a trick. Of course, if x goes to infinity instead of minus infinity, then there is no minus sign, and the answer is 1. This has a different limit at infinity and negative infinity. Negative infinity. This is a, a nice fact. Now, lest you think that whenever there is a root, this same trick applies, let me just say there is almost a trick of a trick. If we were asking a problem here at Princeton in Math 103, say, 
and we put one of these things in, maybe some of you wouldn't recognize the trick, but some of you would. The problem is that we can sort of double cross you. For example, imagine that the limit as x goes to minus infinity involved something like this, the square root of 4x squared. I'm sorry, I mean 4x to the fourth. There we go. The square root of 4x to the fourth. Well, this is actually 2x squared, no matter what x is, even if x is negative. The reason is, this side is positive as always. But that side is positive no matter what x is. So actually, it would be silly to put a minus there, because then that would be negative, and that would be positive. So there's a counterexample. What about something like this? What's the cube root of x cubed? Well, that's true again. It's always equal to x. But the reasoning is slightly different. Now, if x is negative, x cubed is negative, the cube root of a negative number is a negative number. It's only square roots and fourth roots and sixth roots that are always positive. So this is now negative. x is also negative. So when do you have to worry about this? Well, I think you should just look at it and see whether you have it to put a minus sign just by considering what's positive and what's negative. But if you really want a, a rule of thumb, here it is. Suppose that you want to write something like x to the nth root of x to some power. Suppose you want to write this and simplify this as x to the m and decide if you need a negative sign when x goes to minus infinity. Well, you only need the negative sign for x less than 0, of course, when n is even and m is odd. You need to take an eventh root and end up with an odd power. So if you look back at our example over here, we're taking a square root, 2 is even, we end up with x cubed, which is an odd power. This doesn't matter. The 6 is not the important thing. The important thing is the square root here, 2 is even, and you end up with an odd power. That's when you need the minus sign at minus infinity. So watch out for that trap. I have seen it often, at least in Math 103 exams. There are a few other examples in section 4.5 of the book. Great. Well, I'm making good time. I really only have one more type of example to look at. You all have been a little bit rowdy today. No, I'm just kidding. We're sailing through the material. I'd like to talk a little bit about limits involving absolute values. So this is in section 4.6. And this is the last topic for today. So it looks like we'll even finish a bit early. All right. Whenever you have an absolute value, you can convert it into a piecewise defined function. And not only can you do it, I think you should do it. So check this out. Here's something I really want you to learn, because it's going to come up again and again. The absolute value of A is equal to A if A happens to be positive or 0, but otherwise is equal to negative A if A is less than 0. And this actually should be quite familiar. In fact, we've just been looking at this when we've been taking square roots of things like x squared for x to the sixth. See, this is always a positive number. Absolute value of a is positive. 
So if A itself is negative, you've got to put a minus sign in front of the negative number to make it into a positive number. So this definition is true no matter what A is. Now the beauty of it is that whenever you have an absolute value, if you write down this expression, but with each of these five instances of A replaced by whatever you're dealing with, well then, you're golden. You'll know exactly what's going on. Here's a sort of nice example. What's the limit as x goes to 3 from below of the absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3? Well, in order to answer this, let's use the formula that we just wrote up for the absolute value, but replace a by x minus 3. So as an aside, I'm going to go like this. Absolute value of x minus 3 is equal to either x minus 3 itself. I left quite enough room here. If x minus 3 is greater than or equal to 0. Otherwise, it's equal to negative x minus 3. If x minus 3 is less than 0. Now, just look at this for a few seconds. This is exactly the same as the above definition. But every time I saw the capital A, all five of them, one, two, three, four, five, I've replaced capital A by x minus 3. The only thing I want to do to tidy up is I just want to change this to x greater than or equal to 3 and x less than 3. I just want to add 3 in both these equalities. So now we know everything that we need to know about the absolute value of x minus 3. However, that's not what we're taking the limit of. We need to divide it by x minus 3. So let's just take absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3. We'll take this last definition here and say this equals x minus 3. See, the top becomes x minus 3. The bottom is x minus 3 always. So that's 1 if x is greater than or equal to 3. And otherwise, it's let's just take this quantity over here. So it's negative quantity x minus 3 over x minus 3. And that's negative 1 if x is less than 3. And this is almost correct. If you're paying really careful attention, you might see that I've made one slight blunder. It's just a very technical thing. But actually, x cannot be equal to 3. Not because of the absolute value, but because the denominator is 0 when x equals 3. So 3 is not in the domain. Anyway, all this is just a fancy way of saying that the function, if we actually had to graph y equals x minus 3, absolute value over x minus 3, it's just equal to plus 1 when you're to the right of 3 and minus 1 when you're to the left of 3. So it has a, it's like a step. It's called a step function. So from that picture, you can immediately see that the left-hand limit that we're looking for is negative 1. But another way of doing it, which I think is sort of clearer in the context of what we're saying, is to use the formula that we developed rather than just pick it off the graph. I'll show you how to do it from the formula. We're looking for the limit as x goes to 3 from below, the left-hand limit of absolute value x minus 3 over x minus 3. From what I've written over here, when x is less than 3, which it is, you're in this regime. So the function 
is actually equal to negative 1 there. So I simply use my piecewise definition and replace this by the appropriate thing, depending on whether I'm in the left or the right. And in this case, the limit is minus 1. So whether or not you use the graph or the uh, formula, as it were, you end up with the same thing. By the way, this would be true for limit as x goes to 0, absolute value of x over x, or the absolute value could be on the bottom and not on the top. This limit from the right is 1. The limit from the left is negative 1. And the graph of this is like that. That's the sort of canonical example, y equals absolute value of x over x. Or, if you prefer, x over the absolute value of x works out to be the same thing. That's the sort of canonical example. The other example we looked at is just what you get when you replace x by x minus 3. So it's just the translation, as I said at the end of last time. If you replace x by x minus 3, it shifts the graph over to the right by 3. So actually then, what is the two-sided limit? Well, the left hand and right hand are different, 1 and minus 1, so this does not exist. The same if you were to come back over to this limit up here. The right hand limit is plus 1. The left hand limit is minus 1. They're not the same, so the two-sided limit does not exist. All right. Well, that's pretty much what I wanted to say in terms of an introduction to limits. Next time, we're going to use continuity to, well, we're going to use the concept of limit in continuity or to define continuity, which is going to be the idea of drawing a curve without taking your pen off the paper, trying to define that properly. And so then, unless there are any questions,